So he will talk now on the destructive uh, character. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd like to make an announcement. Uh, there's going to be an international Benjamin conference of the International Benjamin Society uh, in a year's time in Frankfurt. And it's going to be based, it's going to be on Benjamin as historian and Benjamin on history. Uh, and I'm co-organizing with Christina Blettler the, one of the sessions uh, on Benjamin historicism and historiography. And because I have had, had a permanent dissatisfaction with the way conferences are organized and the, the filling of all the time with one uh, lecture after another, I suggested uh, to the organizers that we try and experiment in at least the section that I have to do with. Uh, and it's been agreed to. And the experiment is that we will try and prepare the session by doing a blog. And this, of course, will depend on input and uh, interest on, of participants. And the hope is that one would reach a certain stage of discussion. And on, on that basis, then an informed discussion without too many lectures would take place in that space. So, uh, do you have uh, the address for the blog? I don't have the address with the blog, but if you if you contact me, uh, perhaps we can put my my email address on the board. Yes, I will. Uh, I, I can put it on the blog uh, that is for the Benjamin class that we always used for in the young okay. and then I will yeah. directly link it to yeah. you. So all you have to do is to contact me, and I will put you in touch with the the technical organizer of the blog and then you get into the book. Okay. Uh, secondly, I'm going to perhaps disappoint you. I'm, I'm not planning to give you a lecture on the destructive character. I've already written an article uh, longer ago than I care to remember. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I gave a lecture on it last year, which was to turn into a, a contribution to a book. And so I've been working on that lecture. And uh, Stefano Marcassoni is the only person that's seen it. It's become about 65 pages long, and it's still going strong. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll summarize some of the aspects uh, of that lecture, but above all, try and sort out with you, thinking aloud, why I've been obsessed with this text for 30 years, and is this just a quirk of mine, or is there something going on? Are there some stakes involved? Uh, that's one thing. Uh, but also, I, as you just heard, I come from literature, uh, and I believe in commenting on texts, and I believe on the centrality of texts. And so therefore, I'm going to read this text aloud with you, first of all, so that we all have it firmly in our memory. Uh, you remember at a certain point, it's said of the destructive character that uh, misunderstanding uh, is of no interest to in him. It's, it, rubs up, it rubs off him, right? Uh, there are other comments by Benjamin in his own name, sometimes about not caring. One can't spend all one's time uh, sorting out being misunderstood. At the same time, uh, this text is very easily misunderstandable. Uh, and there's been an awful lot of names and themes floating around this morning, which I think uh, the discussion can be partly clarified. Anyway, that's my wager simply by looking at the text very, very clearly. Okay. Uh, not, we won't be able to do that in the time that I have at my disposal, but uh, perhaps at least in some key instances in the discussion we can, we can do that. Anyway, uh, another thing I want to say kind of up from the start is this is a conference organized by people, interdisciplinary philosophers, people interested in political theory and so on. Uh, I'm making a plaidoyer for a literary reading, not in exclusion to any of those, but simply as a kind of uh, resistance to too glibly inserting this text into a general uh, theory discourse. Uh, this text obviously has theoretical implications, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it. It clearly has immense theoretical content. It's not a theoretical text. Uh, it's a very strange text, somewhere in between all kinds of things. Uh, but it, it has a certain resistance to being 
uh, ballooned into uh, a general statement about negativity. Or I don't know. Uh -huh. At the same time, uh, one is seduced by this text into doing, into making those kinds. So somewhere in that kind of area between theory and the concrete <coughs> text, I think somewhere between those two uh, areas, uh, plus a pressure that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, I think this text should be read. So let me simply remind you of the text by simply reading it to you. Then there are also, uh, I've printed out, Notizen über den Destruktiven Karten, which are not usually read with the text. Benjamin made extra notes. We won't look at those unless you really want to. Uh, but I thought it'd be useful to kind of alert you to the fact that there's more material, extraordinarily interesting material, and then it's an interesting fact, I see, it seems to me, that, the, that Benjamin then left out. He pared down his text. And already there, in the paring down of a text, with all kinds of interesting stuff that you and I would have been glad to have uh, uh, printed if we thought of such ideas, Benjamin can al allow himself the luxury or the in inversion of a luxury, the poverty, the poverty of leaving stuff out. <coughs> from the notes to the destructive character. And of course, what is the destructive character about? It's about cutting out and leaving out. So you can even see that in the relationship between the, the notes and the destructive character. So I'll, I'll read it to you in German. You have it in French, huh? in English. So uh, I'll just let me read it to you. <coughs> Der destructive character. Es könnte einem geschehen, dass er beim Rückblick auf sein Leben zu der Erkenntnis käme, fast alle tieferen Bindungen, die er in ihm erlitten habe, seien von Menschen ausgegangen, über deren destruktiven Charakter alle Leute sich einig waren. Er würde eines Tages vielleicht zufällig auf diese Tatsache stoßen und je härter der Schock ist, der ihm so versetzt wird, desto größer sind damit seine Chancen für eine Darstellung des destruktiven Charakters. There follows a space. There follows a space, empty space. And then the text will talk about making empty space. In other words, there's empty space in the text talking about empty space. Uh, I said I was going to read you the whole text, but let me just make a comment on this opening statement because it rather well illustrates what I mean by saying this is not just a theoretical text. The text, it's a text telling you that it could happen to one, einen, einen, uh, some undefined one, uh, that looking back on his or her life, uh, he or she would come to the conclusion that some of his major bonds, right, Bindung, yeah, Bindung uh, had been uh, the result of encounters Painful encounters, these are bonds that have been eliminated. Painful encounters uh, with the destructive character. Why am I saying all this? To, to, to point out that the text begins by alerting us to the fact that this is not a theoretical text. This is someone summarizing uh, or coming to a summarizing retrospective uh, insight with a shock about the encounters he's had with destructive characters, or rather with, with someone about whose destructive character everyone was in agreement. Uh, and so that's also quite interesting for the origin of this notion of destructive character. Someone about, so obviously everyone is in agreement that, that those people have a destructive character, as if this was a general commonly used phrase, although it's not to my knowledge, it's not. I mean, I'm not sure that you very often say he has a destructive character. <laughs> anyway, but in, in, the, in, the, in the text, this is <coughs> taken for granted. And so someone ha having a destructive character is then changed in the course of this paragraph into someone being a destructive character. Yeah. So suddenly, from a, a, an attribute of a character, it becomes the character himself. And then you're reminded of the tradition of les caractères, you know, that goes from Theophrastus through La Boyère. So it's, it's now, instead of... Uh, uh, Lava, you know, in Moliere's comedies, it's not the, it's not the malad, it's not the hypochondriac, it's not this, it's not not the misanthrope, it's the a new a new character that's emerged, the destructive character. Anyway, so uh, the main point is this that uh, 
something is being set up here uh, between the narrator uh, and the figure, the, who the portraitist, and the, the figure that is going to be portrayed. So the portraitist is not the destructive character. He's telling us about the destructive character. So we have a whole framework that is set up that is going to I should, should, should say, is going to warn us not to simply say Benjamin is the destructive character uh, or uh, the destructive character is this or that. It's, it's a portrait of someone who has had a, prof of, of not even someone, of a set of people who have had a profound effect on this. Right. Uh, and what's also quite interesting is the, the destructive character is the, is the man who erases traces and this narrator is going to be the person who uh, preserves the traces of this man who erased traces. So they're not the same, uh, but they make a very significant uh, interaction. So the text then goes on. The destructive character can no eine parole Platz schaffen, no eine Tätigkeit räumen. Sein Bedürfnis nach frischer Luft und freiem Raum ist stärker als jeder Hass. Der destruktive Charakter ist jung und heiter, denn zerstörend verjüngt, weil es die Spuren unseres eigen, eigenen Alters aus dem Weg räumt. Es heitert auf, weil jedes Wegschaffen dem Zerstörenden eine vollkommene Reduktion, ja Radizierung seines eigenen Zustandes bedeutet. Zu solchen Apollinischen Zerstörerbild führt erst recht die Einsicht, wie ungeheuer sich die Welt vereinfacht, wenn sie auf ihre Zerstörungswürdigkeit geprüft wird. I will read that last formula again. Wie ungeheuer sich die Welt vereinfacht, wenn sie auf ihre Zerstörungswürdigkeit geprüft wird. Dies ist das große Band, das alles Bestehende einträchtig umschließt, umschlägt. Das ist ein Einblick, der an Anblick, der dem destruktiven Charakter ein Schauspiel tiefster Harmonie verschafft. Der destruktive Charakter ist immer frisch bei der Arbeit. Die Natur ist es, die ihm das Tempo vorschreibt, indirekt wenigstens, denn er muss ihr zuvorkommen, sonst wird sie selber die Zerstörung übernehmen. Dem destruktiven Charakter schwebt kein Bild vor. Er hat wenig Bedürfnisse und das wäre sein geringstes, zu wissen, was an Stelle des Zerstörten tritt. Zunächst für einen Augenblick zumindest der leere Raum, der Platz, wo das Ding gestanden, das Opfer gelebt hat. Es wird sich schon einer finden, der ihn braucht, ohne ihn einzunehmen. Der destruktive Charakter tut seine Arbeit. Er vermeidet nur Schöpferische. So wie der Schöpfer Einsamkeit sich sucht, muss der Zerstörende fortdauernd sich mit Leuten, mit Zeugen seiner Wirksamkeit umgehen. Der destruktive Charakter ist ein Signal, so wie ein trigonometrisches Zeichen von allen Seiten dem Winden ist er von allen Seiten dem Gerede ausgesetzt. Dagegen ihn zu schützen, ist sinnlos. Der destruktive Charakter ist gar nicht daran interessiert, verstanden zu werden. Bemühungen in dieser Richtung betrachtet er als oberflächlich. Das Missverstanden werden kann ihm nichts anhaben. Im Gegenteil, er fordert, er erfordert es heraus, wie die Orakel diese destruktiven Staatseinrichtungen es herausgefordert haben. Das kleinbürgerlichste aller Phänomene, der Klatsch, kann nur zu, kann, kommt nur zustande, weil die Leute nicht missverstanden werden wollen. Der destruktive Charakter lässt sich missverstehen, er fördert den Klatsch nicht. Der destruktive Charakter ist der Feind des Etui-Menschen. Der Etui-Mensch sucht seine Bequemlichkeit, und das Gehäuse ist ihr Inbegriff. Das Innere des Gehäuses ist die mit Samt ausgeschlagene Spur, die er in die Welt gedrückt hat. Der destruktive Charakter erwischt sogar die Spuren der Zerstörung. Der destruktive Charakter steht in der Front der Traditionalisten. Einige überliefern die Dinge, indem sie sie unantastbar machen und konservieren. Andere die Situationen, indem sie sie handlich machen und liquidieren. Diese nennt man die Destruktiven. Der destruktive Charakter hat das Bewusstsein des historischen Menschen, dessen Grundaffekt ein unbezwingliches Misstrauen in den Gang der Dinge 
und die Bereitwilligkeit ist, mit der er jederzeit davon Notiz nimmt, dass alles schief gehen kann. Daher ist der destruktive Charakter die Zuverlässigkeit selbst. Der destruktive Charakter sieht nichts Dauerndes, aber eben darum sieht er überall Wege. Wo andere auf Mauern oder Gebirge stoßen, auch da sieht er einen Weg. Weil er aber überall einen Weg sieht, hat er auch überall aus dem Weg zu räumen. Nicht immer mit roher Gewalt, bisweilen mit Veredelbarkeit. Weil er überall Wege sieht, steht er selber immer am Kreuzweg. Kein Augenblick kann wissen, was der Nächste bringt. Das Bestehende legt er in Trümmer, nicht um der Trümmer, sondern um des Weges willen, der sich durch sie hindurchzieht. Der destruktive Charakter lebt nicht aus dem Gefühl, dass das Leben lebenswert sei, sondern dass der Selbstmord die Mühe nicht lohnt. Uh, an extraordinarily gripping, an extraordinarily compelling, and an extraordinarily enigmatic text uh, that, I've, that has been haunting me now for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, and that I think requires extensive commentary, uh, which I can't do here in the space of the time, and I don't think this is the place to do it anyway. Uh, just let me remind you of Benjamin's theory of criticism. Uh, what he thinks criticism is about, in two words. Uh, I want to remind you because I think his theory of criticism, of what critique should be, has a lot to do with this text. Uh, criticism is itself destructive. Uh, and moreover, one could, one, there are sections in this text which themselves tell you what critique is about. I'm thinking notably of the passage when he says that with this extraordinary paradox that the destructive character stands in the front of the traditionalists. So you have, you have uh, a war here between the traditionalists and the conservatives, and he's in the front. He's in one of the fronts, but to your surprise, he's not with the people who want to throw away all tradition. He's, in, he's, in the f he's also not in the rear of the traditionalists. He's in the front of the traditionalists. And then it goes on to explain what that means. Uh, he doesn't simply conserve the past, nor, however, is he this reckless this form of destruction that simply wants to massacre the past. I mean, how many theatre productions have you been to where uh, the avant-garde uh, theatre makers know, uh, dramaturg and producers know nothing more modern to do with the text than simply to destroy it, kind of wantonly. He's not into wanton destruction. He's on the side. He's, he's handing on. He, he's handing on. But the whole question is, how do you hand on? In other words, what I'm, to cut a long story short, I'm saying there's a whole theory of criticism or what criticism is about in this text. Uh, that I could show at great length. Uh, in the article I've just written, I, I'd summarize. If I had to summarize, as Benjamin would say, standing on one leg, uh, what uh, he's all about, I think one could say this, no philology without actuality, no actuality without theology, uh, without <laughs> philology. Uh, in other words, I'm, I think that is more or less the same kind of paradoxical uh, between the fronts in a very specific place as is said in the, in the text, between the fronts, handing on, handing on destructively, destructively, constructively, as was said this morning, but in a, very, uh, in a very specific way. And what I want to suggest to you is this, uh, that what this text is telling is about criticism, how you go about it, how the destructive character goes about it, uh, is more or less, I would say, one, I think one could show this at length, Benjamin's own procedure, even though I just said a little while ago, Benjamin's not simply the destructive character, there was large overlap. And what I'm getting at is this. Thereby, the text and Benjamin are asking us to go about reading this text that way. Uh, I think that is the payoff. Right? What we are supposed to do, we have to do now philology, but not philology without actuality, and we have to do actuality, but not without uh, otherwise, I think we're missing the thrust of this text. And it's a very, very tall order. 
Now, what do I mean with no philology without uh, actuality? I mean this, that <coughs> or no actuality without theology. Uh, I think discussions of this text can get wild and undisciplined. I've not, nothing wrong about, nothing, no, no objections to, to uh, a free-for-all discussion, but nevertheless, uh, the discussions can get, I think, way off unless you try and root this text as well as you can in its context, its context of Benjamin's own thinking and its own historical context. Now this may sound to you like very boring traditional criticism. We've always been told by our teachers to do that. Well, the fact that they told us to do that is not in itself wrong. Uh, the whole question is how, how do you do that? How do you do that? And it's a very difficult, in fact, a huge undertaking. And I've written maybe 50, 60 pages. I don't think I've even begun to scratch the surface of situating that in this context. You have to know about Benjamin's own writings. Several of them were mentioned today, notably the Brecht writings, notably the Kraus, notably all kinds of others. Uh, I've done a whole appendix on uh, the afterlife of the destructive character in Benjamin's uh, Paralipomena to the thesis on philosophy of history. So alone the, ch alone the task of tracing this character in Benjamin's works is quite large, but it's doable. But then what's more difficult, more open-ended is where was all this coming from? Where, where is this text inserting itself in the history of the time? And the, the notions of destruction that were circulating at the time and so on. Where is it, uh, where is it in relation to them? And what is it doing with them? There's obviously some Nietzsche in here. There's all kinds of stuff. So doing that is a huge task. You could, you could, however, do it till the cows come home. You could, there's no end to that kind of task. It's kind of ufa right? uh, And that's why you always have to have the call of actuality. The, point, the question is, you have to do this philology. Why? One of the reasons is just to let the text resist you and your present and your present day assumptions as much as possible. Uh, actualizing, says Benjamin, is not galvanizing and is not, you know, bringing it into, at all costs into the present. I mean, the notion of actuality and actualizing Benjamin can be a very radical complaint, uh, uh, enterprise. It can also be a totally conformist enterprise. Everyone does that. I mean, the way that people just pick up this text and use it. You go onto the internet and you see the, the destructive character being put to this, this end and that. So, I mean, people are doing actualization. The question is, they're not doing it very well or in a very informed way because they don't have the philology. Now, I'm not making some kind of scholars, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> patronizing comment against journalists here. But nevertheless, you do better journalism, and you have to do a certain kind of journalism, if you know where it's coming from. Because it's, it's obviously coming from a very strange place. It's a very, very strange text. It's very hard to hold all of this text in your head. I mean, <coughs> most of us just, you know, take a little bit of it. Uh, and go places with it. But maybe the text, uh, I mean, I remember Hans Robert Jaus, not a very radical uh, critic, saying years ago, one of the justifications for literary criticism and contextualization is showing the otherness, the alienness of the work you're dealing with. Uh, there's no point in actualizing if the thing was already so actual to begin with. Uh, it's, you, you have to actualize ac across a, uh, a distance in time when you're dealing with a text that is very alien to the present. And it's only that alienness that is worth uh, dealing with. Otherwise, there'll be no tension between the, the philology and the actuality. If the, if the two poles, the then and the now, are already so much. Uh, so that's my plea for doing a lot of philology. I won't try and summarize what I've said about uh, the philology here. Uh, maybe just one, one more Benjamin quote. You remember in the Paralipomena to the Thesis on the Philosophy of History, there's this wonderful image of what the historical materialist does. Uh, his, historical research uh, work is like a pair of scales, and in one of the two scales you have the past, uh, and you can't have enough insignificant facts of the past in the one pan. That sounds like historicism. It sounds like Benjamin's worst enemy. 
But you can't have enough of it. You, you can't root, you can't embed the text, to use a, a verb that Benjamin uses about Baudelaire, you can't embed it uh, enough. That's, but that's the one pan. And then the other pan, you have a few heavy weights, a few massive weights, and they are the present. They are the present. And those have to counterbalance one another. And when the scales comes into a kind of trembling balance, always a shifting balance, then you'll have done historical justice uh, to the text. Uh, bear in mind that notion of a few heavy weights, because there, again, I think we're going to come to something that's very close to the destructive character. Uh, I'm not going to say that much more, because I want to leave the time open to discussion as much as possible. But I want to give you just two more quotes. Uh, one that I use as the uh, motto of the whole essay, a fairly well-known quote from a letter that Benjamin wrote to Gretel Adorno in 1934. I'll, trade, I'll translate it into English. In the economy of my existence. It's already interesting. His existence has an economy. The existence has an economy. Uh, there's not time for everything. Uh, there's also thought and existence has an economy. Uh, so in the economy of my existence, a small countable number of relations play a role which enable me to maintain the pole that is opposed to my original being. So he's talking about, uh, the context is interesting. Uh, Great Adorno and Adorno have been complaining to him or warning him about Brecht's influence. So this is a reply justifying Brecht's influence, but generalizing more. Right? Brecht belongs to this small number of relations which enable him to maintain in this economy a pole other or even opposed to his own being. You remember the beginning, the opening lines of the destructive character? One could encounter people who had a, you know, who were very other than oneself, who had this painful impact on one. I think it's very similar to what he's saying, uh, what he's saying. <coughs> my life, as well as my thought, moves in extreme positions. The breadth that it thereby maintains asserts the helpted, acquires its complexion from danger, a danger that uh, acquires its uh, face, form, precisely in those so-called dangerous relations, gefährliche Beziehung. They, they'd warned him, Brecht is dangerous for you, and he turns it around with a kind of probably a a hidden relation to Laclos, uh, Laclos, les liaisons dangereuses, uh, and says, yes, these are dangerous relations, and that is exactly what I need. Yeah? Uh, and clearly, Brecht was one such thing, one, one such. And as we as was said this morning, and as I think I, I can show in some detail, if I have the time, or in the discussion, it's Brecht above all. If you had to name one destructive character in Benjamin's existence, it would be Brecht. And I think that can be shown. And if we have time, I'd like to show it in one particular instance. Remind me later if I forget uh, about what is the most troubling line of all for me in the destructive cut, or the one that makes me very uneasy. Uh, and apropos Brecht, apropos Brecht, let me uh, simply now quote you and then I'll stop. quote to you a page out of a radio broadcast that Benjamin made about Brecht in 1930, so early on, one year before the destructive character. He uh, has a wonderful radio talk about Brecht, and towards the end, he starts to talk about a Brecht character called Herr Koiner. Uh, let me just make a parenthesis. Uh, the title of my new, the title of my old essay on, on, on Benjamin was No Man's Land. 
the title of the new one is No Man. Uh, I'm trying to explain what this strange character is. Uh, is he a man? It's not exactly a mensch. Uh, Benjamin refers in, in text that one can use to explain the destructive character, like the Faun Amut. He refers to Unmensch, Baba. Uh, a coiner, who by the way is quite often uh, reduced to her car, so the destruction, reduction of the name, almost practically no name, almost nameless. Uh, it also turns out, as, 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 as Benjamin notes along the way, that, well, where did, the, where did the name coiner come from? Well, apparently it was a bit of a joke for Brecht. It was, some kind of di dialectical, dis dialectal, not dialectical, dialectal distortion of her kina. But in her koina, says Benjamin, there's also a Greek root. A root is not interesting because the destructive character, radizia, so uh, this destructive character is all about roots. So uh, the root of the name koina is Greek koinos, which means in the general interest of interesting, interesting the general. So you have a whole complex already in the name a koina, uh, a complex which is very related to the destructive character of being <coughs> no man, not your usual, not an individual, <coughs> rather faceless, rather faceless, and at the same time, uh, precisely on that basis opening onto the general. Let me now read to you this one paragraph about Hakona. Why am I reading you this? Because it, reading this, I think, brings home to us in extraordinarily simple fashion, an extraordinarily drastic fashion, what the destructive character is about. And I think it raises some huge questions that can perhaps make all of us rather uncom uncomfortable. <coughs> So I'll read it in English. Her coiner's vice is cold and un incorruptible thought. What is this good for? Think. It's good for bringing people to the point where they become clear about the assumptions they, that have led them to the so-called leaders, Führer, the thinkers or politicians, their books or speeches, and then to subject these assumptions to as thorough a criticism as possible. It will turn out to be a whole bundle of assumptions that will f all fall apart once you have loosened the strings that bring them together. So, a coiner is someone who can loosen the strings, loosen this cord that holds together all our premises that prevent us from thinking and thinking for ourselves. I think there's a, a direct link between that passage uh, and the one where it says, in the destructive character, where it's saying the destructive character is the one who tests the world for its destructibility. Uh, and that is the bond, says this text, very abgründig, very it's, it's deeper than irony. That is the bond that holds the world together. You know, in Goethe's Faust, it is uh, you know, some kind of life force that holds the world together. What here <coughs> holds together, the glue that holds the world together here is sheer conformism. It's not thinking, it's just the, this idiotic uh, consensus. Uh, and Koina is, uh, is unloosing that. <coughs> uh, the strings that bind them together. The strings of fixed opinion, somewhere or other, people are certainly thinking. We can rely on this. Notables who have the right posts and are paid for it, thinkers who are paid to think, uh, will think for everyone else are conversant with the relevant procedures and are permanently occupied in disposing of the doubts and obscurities that remain. 
by the way, in the German, it's the Ausräumen. So these paid thinkers who obscure reality for us, they clear away our doubts. In other words, clearing away is a notion of the destructive character. So there's destruction on the other side. There's destruction on the part of, uh, of the paid thinkers. That was said a lot this morning, but the destruction is on both sides. So capitalism is also the destruction, not just counter destroyer. If you were to deny this, you could prove that this is not the case. The public will undoubtedly be overcome by a certain anxiety, because it might run the risk of having to think for itself. Now, Herr Coiner concentrates his attention on showing that the this is what matters to me here. That the plethora of problems and theories, theses and worldviews, is a fiction. Hakoina says, Hakoina is an emblem of poverty and impoverishment and simplification. Remember what it says in the destructive character? He, when you look at the world with a view to its destructibility, it becomes simplified. That's the way of simplifying the world. This is an argument for simplification. Uh, there's an expression in French, a terrible simplificateur. That's what the destructive character is, a terrible simplificateur. And here we're seeing in Coiner what is involved in that. Uh, namely, and this is, you know, he's talking about the public that could become made uneasy, but what I'm trying to suggest is this should make us <coughs> rather uneasy. Because, you know, uh, we're at a conference dealing with destruction. All kinds of names are being handed around, you know, uh, from Deleuze and Guetta and Guattari. I mean, and what, what would Coiner say if he was here? Yeah. What is he saying? He's saying, uh, concentrates his attention on showing that the plethora of problems <coughs> and theories, theses and worldviews, is a fiction. And the fact that they all cancel each other out is neither accidental nor grounded in thought itself. Rather, it is grounded in the interests of the people who have placed the thinkers in their posts. Does this mean the public will now want to know that thinking corresponds to specific interests? Doesn't thought stand above all interests? At this point, the public will undoubtedly start to feel uneasy. If people think in the service of specific interests, who will guarantee that these are the interests of the public? And with this, the knot is untied and the bundle of assumptions <coughs> falls apart, transforming itself into sheer question marks. Is thinking worthwhile? Should it be of use? What benefits it in reality and to whom? Blunt questions, all of them, no doubt. But we are, or so says Herr Koiner, but we, or so says Herr Koiner, have nothing to fear from blunt questions. We have our most refined answers ready to hand to those blunt questions. For this is the nature of our relation to those other people. They understand how to pose subtle and sophisticated questions. But they swamp the sewers of their questions with the tidal sludge of their answers. That unfiltered wealth, which is beneficial for a few and detrimental to almost everyone. We, on the other hand, pose down-to-earth questions. But we let the answers through only if they have been screened, gazeeped, three times over. Precise, clear answers in which the attitude of the speaker as well as the substance of what is said, becomes transparent. So much for a coiner. Uh, and it's at that point, I think, that the destructive character really raises big questions for us. Because we see here what the implications of the destructive character are for theoretical discussion, for all our discussion. Namely, uh, what are our priorities? Why are we reading this text? Why are we thinking? What to do? Uh, can't we simplify our theoretical? This is a plea for simplicity. A radical simplification in the name of efficacy. Just let me say one more thing and then I'll stop. Uh, 
actualizing this text means, in terms of you know, what the destructive character would do, taking what we can from it. I mean, I'm, on the one hand, I'm pleading for you know, the most careful philology, the most scrupulous philology that uh, doesn't leave anything out. Uh, the most careful detail, uh, not for its own sake, but for then, on that basis, then saying, what can we take from this text? What can we leave out? What no longer works? What does? And so on. And what I'm also suggesting is that uh, these texts 